longevity so last century? I don't think so. Today we're going to explore I Do, Memoirs of Marriage, and we're going to talk about couples who have been married for more than 50 years and how they've managed to make it work. And today on It's All Right with Suzette, my name is Suzette martinez Standring. I'm going to be interviewing one of the co-editors of this fabulous compilation of stories. And I want to welcome Giselle Wolf Klein. Thank you for having me, Suzette. I'm very happy to be here. Oh, it's great to have you. And um, Giselle is a medical internist, and she has been working for over 30 years as a geriatrician um, with the Long Island LIJ healthcare system there and has spent over 30 years working with older adults from where this wonderful book came about. So could you tell us a little bit about how you came to co-edit this book with clinical social worker Barbara Vogel? Well, I've had the very good fortune of working at the North Shore LIJ Health System for 30 years. I actually did my training there way back when. Uh, they had the very first program in geriatric medicine in the country. And I knew I wanted to work with older adults, so I had to come here to do my training. So I trained, did my fellowship. I had the good fortune of being asked to become the program director, and I have remained as the program director and director of education for the health system uh, since 1976. So you can see it's a long time. And one of the things that has struck me and uh, the team that I work with, uh, led by Barbara Vogel, our social worker, is how these older couples uh, come to our practice with all their health concern, their worries, their issues, and they're still married, and they still love each other like teenagers. And after a while, I was wondering, you know, what is their secret? And so we started looking into this, and then we discovered real treasures. Yes. There's a, there's a series of stories in this book, and they all talk about their lives. Each couple talks about their lives, and you find that it isn't just a matter of love at first sight and happily ever after. Like, for instance, in the story of Marion and Norman Glazero, which was one of the first stories, really great. You know, she, she talks about her life and the difficulty they had not being able to have their own children, adopting, and then the untimely deaths of two of their three children. So, you know, in each each of the stories, you can see that there is, there is a lot of hardship and struggle, and yet they've managed to keep their love alive. I mean, in fact, they're the, the, they're the couple featured here. You can see that there are a couple of hot tickets right there. So can you talk a little bit about that particular story? I, I certainly can. It's, it's, a, it's a charming story right from the beginning. Uh, Marion was actually very young when she met her husband-to-be. And uh, she met him the way any mother would absolutely panic if her child brought that story. Uh, Marion came from a, a rather well-to-do uh, background, and she announced to her parents that she had fallen in love and was going to marry this young man. And the parents were happy to hear about that and sort of asked you know, what the young man did and so on and so forth and uh, what did it look like and so on. She said, oh, she hadn't met him, you know, she hadn't seen him. She had just heard his voice because he was a radio jockey trying to make it with music of some sort. And um, he didn't really have a job, but she wanted to go on a date with him. Well, the parents weren't too thrilled with that, but they realized very quickly that there was really nothing much they could do about it because this young lady was quite determined to meet the young man. As it turns out, she was in for a surprise. She was, and still is, an extremely beautiful and very athletic, petite woman. Mm -hmm. um, she's really exceptionally beautiful and remains extremely active. She was at that time a uh, pretty much a professional skater, uh, ice skater and uh, love this. And when uh, she eventually uh, got in touch with the young man, she says, you know, why don't we go skating together as a first date? She wanted to show off, you know, how well she would dance on the ice. And he actually thought I wasn't such a good idea. He said, you know, why don't I 
just pick you up in the car. Maybe we could go for a drink somewhere. So she said, okay. And it's not until she got into the car that she discovered that he actually was paralyzed uh, on one leg because he had polio. So here's this young couple going from her dream of showing herself on ice and now meeting with this young man who she believes she is in love with, who is handicapped. Mm -hmm. So that's how it starts. You know, in the book, as I said, the cover, as you can see, is Marion and Norman Glassero it, on their wedding day. And then inside you have a picture of them today. And what I really loved about this book is not only does it tell the stories of each of the couples, but you as the editor and, and, and clinician in many ways picked out one particular element, one particular bonding element that seemed to carry and sustain the relationship. And in each of these couples featured, there is a different element for everything. And you have the scientific research and facts about how that actually works on the human brain. And in the case of Marion and Norman Glassero, music, you said, you know, you have um, right after their story, there's a little bit about how music was a common thread. Can you talk about, let's say, the, um, the, the scientific aspects of how music played a part in bonding yes. their relationship. So this was extraordinary. The first time Marion invited me to visit uh, Norman at their home, mm -hmm. uh, Norman was at the piano and he was playing magnificently. Now at the time he was well in his 80s mm -hmm. and he was quite frail and um, he, so he was literally playing a magnificent piece and he turned around and wanted to get up. When I came in, it was difficult for him to get up at that time. And I, I told him just to stay there and I would sit next to him, which I did. Mm -hmm. And he continued to play the music. And one of the things that struck me was that Marion came by and just sort of put her shoulder, uh, her hand on his shoulder and just listened to this. And you could see that they had literally spent 65 years of love together listening to the piano, the music. And so this was one of the aspects that um, clearly maintained their love and their support to each other throughout very, very difficult times, which are described in her cha chapter. And I decided that it would be a good idea to research what music can do mm -hmm. for couples, for friendships. And there's absolutely no doubt that um, our brain is wired, a uh, certain part of our brains are wired to music, and music actually um, is a very deep connection uh, to some of our childhood memories, our early uh, process, learning process. In fact, it is something that is used uh, for people who have difficulty with speech. They uh, learn the tunes and then the words sort of link on, the lyrics link on to the tune and help you reminisce. So it, it really connects with all kinds of different neuropath, um, which clearly have a connection. So people who, for whatever reason, don't have a lot in common, but can literally sing the same song yes. or dance to the same tune, um, seem to connect extremely well. You know, there was another particular story by uh, Robert and Marge Schwe Schweiben. Yeah. Schweiben. And uh, it, the common thread in their marriage was the power of touch. And I think that many of us know couples who they're constantly touching each other's mm -hmm. arm mm -hmm. or um, caressing mm -hmm. or hugging mm -hmm. each other. And for them, that uh, the power of touch was a very big element. And after their story, you talk about the scientific aspects of how that bonds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. And, and the Schreibmans. In fact, so let me tell you first about the Schreibmans. Schreibmans are another extraordinary couple. Um, it, they were somehow, I think, the inspiration to that whole chapter. It was the first time that I literally saw in this elderly couple um, who had been married over 60 years, absolute true love. Mm. In, but the kind of love that you see in you know, 12 years old who are holding hands for the first time and not sure if it's okay or not. Yes. It's a, just a charming what a lot of people refer to as puppy love. Yes. And it was still present 70 years later. Um, Marjorie, when I first met her, uh, was unfortunately suffering from dementia. 
Mm. And uh, she had reached an advanced stage. She was physically very healthy, but she had reached an advanced stage where she couldn't really communicate anymore. Um, it was unclear whether she'd recognize her friends and families. Both she and Bob came to my office, and Bob was quite concerned and wanted to see if there was anything I can do medically to help his wife, who was not suffering physically, but you know he wanted to keep her alive as long as possible. And she was sitting next to him. She was unaware of the fact that this was a medical office. She was not particularly concerned about what I was doing there. All she was doing was looking at him. And at some point, she noticed that his collar, his blazer's collar, was sort of well, up. And she decided to fix it for her, you know, as she probably had done mm -hmm. si for 60 years. Yes. And then just sort of cleaned it up a little bit, dusted off a little bit, and just held his hand. And they turned to each other. I mean, I was interviewing them. But they stopped talking to me, and they just turned to each other, just touched each other, and I figured, you know, I wasn't there. They were back in this loving relationship mm -hmm. that literally was no different than when they were, you know, teenagers. It was an extraordinary moment. It is. Yeah. And I love the fact that you, this book plums the depths of the essential element of love in each of these couples, mm -hmm. which is very different and unique yes. to each relationship. And we're going to take a short break, and in a, in a little bit we're going to come back and we're going to explore the secrets of marital longevity as related and shared by couples who have been married over 50 years. So stay tuned. And we're back to explore the book, I Do, Memoirs of Marriage with Giselle Wolf Klein. So I'm very interested, you know, how many couples are featured in this book? Eleven. Eleven. <laughs> and, and, I'm sorry, let me rectify this. Eleven and a half. Eleven, because you, your, your memoir appears in the introduction? No, because the last couple who was married over 50 years, our criteria for being part of this, um, experienced an interesting twist of event. The one of the, uh, the, the, the one of the partner unfortunately passed. Mm. And I continued to take care of the husband. And about a year or two after the, the wife had died, came to me, he said, you know, I think I've met another woman. And I said, really? And he said, and it doesn't take anything away from Cindy because she was my love. She is my love. But this woman is very special. And so I think I'm going to enter a relationship again. Well, good for and him. And so that is the other half. Yes. You know? Yes. Now, we talked a little bit about how each couple has a very unique thread. Like, I noticed that after each story, it's the element of perhaps spirituality that was very binding, mm -hmm. or uh, respect, or humor, lust. That was an interesting mm -hmm, chapter. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and so I wanted to know, how did you discern what that bond was to discuss on a scientific basis after each story. Did you discern that or did you ask the couple what was it, what is the, you know, the unifying element in your marriage? So I think the answer to your question is that through my training as a physician, I've learned and I've tried to master the art of listening. Mm -hmm. So I had absolutely no idea what would come out of the stories and I very much wanted this to be the couple's story. It was yes. never my story. Yes. And they would tell, and the, the rule, if you would, to get into the book would be that you would have to have been married 50 years and you would also be willing to share the good, the bad, and the indi indifferent and knowing that the bad could be very bad. And it was and it in is. many cases in the stories. Absolutely. And if you were uncomfortable sharing this, then you couldn't be part of the book. This was totally voluntary. And my role 
was just to let them speak mm -hmm. and to listen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at some point they would say, well, you know, I don't know how we did it. And I would listen because they would continue to talk and say, well, maybe it was because we were praying together. Or maybe it was because regardless of what was going on, regardless of the fights we had, regardless of the anger problem we had, we slept together that night. Mm -hmm. And that was powerful. Mm -hmm. So that's where it was. There was another story that I thought was remarkable, again, with, you know, fraught with all kinds of issues and, and tears and so on. But they decided to find some sense of humor in all these situations. So mm -hmm. they were able to laugh together. Mm -hmm. The key is what you like to do together. What you like to do together. That's it. Mm -hmm. You can laugh together, you can pray together, you can sleep together, mm -hmm. you can do whatever it is provided us together. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the writers um, in this book was asked, do you believe in love at first sight? Mm -hmm. And he said, I believe in attraction yes. at first sight, but love develops. And so in your experience, what do you think is missing in modern society that there are so many divorces now? Do you think it was just a, um, a result of the time and the generation, the commitment, the expectation, perhaps the obligation? Um, what is so different in modern society now that they don't have that these people had? It's a great question. I think, unfortunately, we have become a disposable society. We purchase a car, a refrigerator, a piece of clothing, and we dispose of it because it's no longer fashionable. It's perfectly fine. It works, but we want something newer, you know. Um, and this is perhaps good for business. It's certainly not good for the ecology and mm -hmm. our green planet. Mm -hmm. We are constantly disposing of things. And so we dispose of our friends, of our families, of our spouses, the way we di dispose of our tissues. Mm -hmm. uh, if it doesn't fit the need right now, if there's an issue with it, you don't try to mend it. You don't try to keep it. You don't try to restore it. You just dispose of it and move on to the next object. When I think about couples who are struggling in their marriage, and I often believe there's no kind of lonely than when you're in a relationship with someone that is not present for you mm -hmm. at all. And I hear what you say about us being a disposable society. But at the same time, there is a great sorrow in a lot of marriages and an inability, as you say, to work through it. So what can the reader learn from people like this who have gone through tremendous sorrow and mm -hmm, hardship mm -hmm, in their own mm -hmm. lives? What, do you think that it's some kind of deep bond that some people are just fortunate enough to have that no matter what, they're going to see it through because they love each other so much? Or is it something that you can manufacture? Again, it's another excellent question. I'm not sure that I know. I do believe that there are situations that cannot be worked out and where a break, a divorce, is certainly the best answer. I do not believe that you can work out any problem or every problem. Uh, but I think that to give up too quickly mm -hmm. Uh, or to think of um, fake solutions, which I've also had. You know, our, our marriage is on the brink. Let's have a child that'll fix it. Ah, you know? yes. Uh -huh. That's a very dangerous solution, mm -hmm. or fake solution. Yes. Um, I think that things are worth a try. Yes. And I think we need to attempt to correct the situation. I truly believe that every human being, and I've been fortunate to take care of thousands of human beings, every human being has uh, things to offer. Uh, you know, we're on this planet, we have messages, we have a purpose. It may be, not be the purpose that you and I might be interested in, but that doesn't make it a wrong purpose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's try to understand what the purpose of that person is, and let's try to find out if it is a purpose that you can support, that you can help direct, that you can balance, you know. Um, it's a question of better understanding ourselves and accepting different interests, different culture, different beliefs. Mm -hmm. 
You know, it's one of the things that I got from reading the stories is that many of these people married right away. They mm -hmm. fell in love and they married right away. And, and there wasn't any of this, let's become deep friends yes. first. And yet somehow they were able to endure. <laughs> and, um, I, and so I don't know if you consider it some kind of deep intuitive perfect match kind of thing? Or is it the character of people that they will persevere no matter what? That's, that these two people have that in their character? Perhaps. I think it's also a society ethics where the concept of commitment was very much present. If you took vows, um, those vows were serious. They were not just part of a, you know, fantasy wedding uh, in order to have a party but rather true words celebrated any religion that it would be, that's, that's irrelevant, um, where you really meant that you wanted to spend your, the rest of your life with the person that you did want to marry. And you know, we only have a couple of minutes left, but I would like viewers to know how they can buy this book. And I'd also like you to say a few words about Barbara Vogel, your co-editor. Certainly, so the book is available on Amazon both in paperback, that's the one that you're holding here, or on Kindle. So it's just on Amazon uh, the book. And Barbara Vogel, uh, my colleague, is a social worker who's had pretty much as many years experience dealing with older adults and is able to support them through these psychological issues that they can face. Yes. Well, it's been such a pleasure to have you. And it's really encouraging, I think, to spend half an hour talking about I do. Mem Memoirs of Marriage, very positive. And I think that reading it gives a lot of people hope and lessons on making it work. So thank you for being with us today. And thanks for tuning in to It's All Right with Suzette. We'll see you next time.